And it's my pleasure to be here this morning, a lovely meeting that Bob chairs, and I'm grateful for the invitation, and also to the IMADEX team um, for letting me get in today, because we had a very busy day at uh, the center yesterday, so I wasn't able to come down last night. Um, so my job is to sort of uh, help frame this a little bit around Ruben, and I think what Ruben presented so nicely is a very cogent argument for bringing monoclonal antibody therapy up front, no question about it. What I would suggest to you, though, as we think about myeloma, and we heard so nicely earlier from Ola about the whole construct of trying to throw a big net around this disease as early as possible and shut it down as quickly as possible, really does make sense. My argument is not that it should be one versus the other, but ultimately perhaps it should be all. That in fact we have an imid proteasome inhibitor backbone and that we add to that with the antibodies selectively, perhaps, perhaps not, in an effort to sort of reach where we should be in my view, which is the sort of equivalent of the CHOP rituxan platform that's used, for example, in large B cell, uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Before I get started, just quickly my disclosures. And just to move forward, lovely. So just to emphasize that point, I think some of you may have seen this slide before, but I find it very helpful. Um, just to describe really that myeloma is obviously not just one disease. And I think one important point is that as we've understood that there's variance between patients, there's enormous variance within a patient. And there's this real entity of clonal tiding um, that we're beginning to better understand. And that's a real phenomenon. And again, I think adds strength to the argument that uh, therapeutic parsimony uh, is not to be recommended. As we think about novel agents and what an impact they've made in myeloma, it's summarized really here, and I emphasize in red the proteasome inhibitors and the imids to show you that really um, the, the backbone or the core of our therapeutic uh, platform remains in that space. And I want to build arguments for you um, to show why I think it will be a, not a zero-sum game, but rather the opposite, a combination of all. Um, one thing to remember, exciting as progress has been as in myeloma, regrettably we're not curing anyone in my experience. We have long-term survivors. We have a, a, a very significant group of patients who die early. They, they are real. And I think amongst the optimism that we have, which is well placed, I think in fairness to our patients and families who fall into these categories, uh, we also need to be very, uh, very clear um, that there are groups of patients who do not do well. Uh, and they need to be addressed, I think, primarily. Now, another point to emphasize is this whole construct of heterogeneity at diagnosis. This is a, a series of studies summarized on the following slide to really emphasize the point that there are multiply genetically distinct subclones at diagnosis. And so as you throw this big net of therapeutics around the disease, it's very important to understand that. And building upon that is some lovely data from my colleague Nikhil, um, which is whole genome sequencing in a patient of ours at diagnosis. The bottom line here is you've got 5,000 mutations uh, in this WGS done on his tumor at presentation. Um, that's a formidable challenge. And when you see this poor gentleman relapse after multiple therapies, including uh, a high-dose melphalan, um, you see that this is remarkably more unstable and that there are now 12,000 mutations in this disease. My point here is that as we attack this disease, it doesn't seem to me rational um, that we limit our therapeutic choices. We need to bring them all together. And again, the biological backbone of proteasome inhibition built on the platform of immunomodulation then combined with antibodies, for example, going forward, does seem to me the most rational. So the, the focus of my argument is going to be about the critical role of combination therapy, and as we think about how we target the disease, that again, it's a combinatorial strategy, bringing our best drug, drugs together. Rational combination strategies are built around a variety of uh, hypotheses. This is from a, a paper we published some years ago, which still applies. There is a strong biological rationale for the imid proteasome inhibitor-based uh, platform, and it's summarized here. Multiple pathways um, through which these drug classes work. I think what's very important to recognize is that, of course, the newer drugs add to this platform. Third-generation imids, the more potent uh, proteasome inhibitors such as carfilzomib um, really do add to this in addition, in my view, and of course the antibodies follow. Now, a critical point to understand is the complexity of mechanism. Immunomodulatory agents, we now understand, have a remarkable immune effect when originally, of course, the hypothesis behind their use was that they were antiangiogenic. We also recognize they do much more than that. Combined with that is the fact that when you can put them together with a proteasome inhibitor in model systems, there's remarkable synergy. Interestingly, you might hypothesize from the mechanism that I just showed you a moment before that there might be the opposite. In fact, that's not true. There is true synergy between these drugs. This is informative data from some years ago now, both from Konstantin Mitsiadis and Teru Hidishima, which helped inform us with a variety of studies of combining these drugs and seeing remarkable results as a result. 
This has been further validated when we put together next generation drugs, and of course the Aspire study I think exemplifies that with remarkable data from the combination uh, going forward and the FDA approval that followed. And of course Exazimib has done the same thing um, with the data showing progression-free survival benefit over a prolonged period. Now when you set that back together and bring us now back to induction, to me it makes complete sense then that as we put the current paradigm of initial treatment together, the three drug platform is essential, the IMID, the proteasome inhibitor, and the steroid, and my position would be that then you add the antibody to that. I do want to show this slide only to emphasize the addition of the fourth agent isn't always a home run. With traditional chemotherapeutics, we saw with this comparative study, or I should comparative analysis across studies, that whilst the response rates were broadly similar, Toxicity is actually dominated with the cytotoxic chemotherapy and have to be treated with some caution. Having said that, in particular high-risk patients, for example, a patient I saw yesterday with plasma cell leukemia, for example, we're treating him successfully with CVDR, uh, and he's having a beautiful response. So there are specific patients in whom this approach might be reasonable. Having said that, just bear that in mind, because to me anyway, RVD or KRD plus an antibody seems the logical next step. Now, what high-level data do we have? Now, Paul Rubin doesn't have this phase three data up front to support his argument. I think he will uh, within the next year or two, but I would argue it goes beyond that. And here we have an example of RVD versus RD from Brian Dury's study in the SWOG group. Bob's part of it did a phenomenal job of this study, I think, very, very important, because it established as a standard of care that the triplet is superior to the doublet, not only for PFS, but very importantly in newly diagnosed disease, we saw an OS signal early. That's remarkable. And I think that's important as we think about this data. So clearly the triplet up front outperforming the doublet. How can we improve on RVD? I just want to do a quick shout out for sub cubortezomib, but just one thing to be careful of. This is from our Irish colleagues, great response rates, really remarkably reduced neuropathy of all grades, about half what we would expect, and minimal grade three. One interesting point, just for practitioners in the audience, don't forget to hydrate when you give sub cubortezomib. I was just at an NCI meeting in neuropathy, and there's a real rationale for having a, a, adequate volume status at the time of bortezomib exposure to reduce free radical injury to the neuron. And anyone who wants to understand better, I'm happy to talk about it later, but please don't forget that, because we put sub-Q with hydration in this study in the Irish group, great rates. In the, in the US study, we've been much more conservative with hydration, and we've been struck that there is a difference. Anyway, that being said, what about RVD and other strategies? Well, I just want to show you some uh, slides from the paper published yesterday from our French partners in the New England Journal. <laughs> As uh, Ola said, be a little bit careful of what you see in the New England Journal. I, I guess that's going to have to be said to be true. Oh, no, he's, well, yeah, yes, exactly, but we were losing a little bit of irony there, I think. Anyway, having said that, I can attest to, to my French partners here because this has been a privilege to be part of, uh, and it's a remarkable parallel series of studies, and the U.S. effort will follow, and everyone on this table is involved in that US trial, so thank you to all. But in any event, what did it show? Well, it shows basically that transplant versus RVD alone, you see a significant PFS advantage, about 14 months. What's so interesting is that it doesn't translate into a survival benefit yet. Perhaps it will, we don't know. But what is clearly true for US practice is the option of transplant early versus late remains a real one. This data strongly supports that. The reason I show this is because triplet therapy has been a backbone, and what I want to really emphasize, and this is what I think is so exciting, is this is actually the best results we've ever seen. We have never seen survivals as good as this in a prospective phase three randomized trial incorporating transplant ever, regardless of which arm you're on. So my argument would be, it's not a subtraction from that three drug platform that we need to think about, but it's an addition to it. So I completely agree with Ruben, we need to add antibodies, but my argument would be on top of the platform rather than, as it were, subtracting one to the other. This is just response data for those who are interested, showing high quality responses in both groups actually, but a significant advantage to transplant. The snag is the toxicity that we saw with the transplant that's real, and we can talk about that perhaps at, uh, in, in co during coffee. In any event, where do we go? Well, going forward, obviously, we think about the three drug platform, proteasome inhibitor, imid, and steroid, plus an antibody as we go forward. That would be my argument. 
And to support that, I want to share some very provocative KRD data led by Andres Jakubowiak and Todd Zimmerman, presented at uh, ASH in December. Really dramatic results. I mean, look at these extraordinarily high quality results. The stringent CR rate, almost 75%. And again, I think this is extraordinary data going forward. So the conclusions from Andre and Todd's work, uh, basically that there are high rates of response based upon this platform. The stringent CR rates are very real. Uh, basically, transplant seems to result in higher rates of MRD when built on this platform compared to when you don't do that. But obviously, we've got a few cautions here. We can touch on that in a moment when we get to a second study that supports this. And deep responses from the three-drug platform are very important as we go forward. So conclusions of that. Basically, KRD, a phenomenal new approach. One word of caution, however, our French partners did a very similar trial in a slightly less rigorous fashion. What I mean by less rigorous is this study group, which we were part of, the Andres group, were extremely well organized and extremely carefully followed. Our patients were micromanaged, it's fair to say. This IFM experience is more real world in my experience. It's basically multiple centers participating. What did they see? Same response rates, very exciting and very, very good. What was sobering was the toxicity. A lot of vascular toxicity has emerged, and we do believe there's a real mechanism here for carfilzomib toxicity that's based upon endothelial damage, and it explains a multiplicity of what we see, be it thrombotic, cardiac, renal, hypertensive, etc. So very important thing that we need to go after, because with the quality of this proteasome inhibitor, we just need to say, well, look, how do we manage its toxicity better? And I think that's the forward direction. Okay, so monoclonal antibodies, I'm not going to dwell on this because Ruben did a such a nice job of it. My argument here is why would we build upon the PI IMID platform? Well, through direct and indirect effects, antibodies work. In that context, there are multiple mechanisms. And obviously, we know the DARA story so well. It's been a remarkable sea change for us. It's a true game changer in my view. And this is the slide I wanted to show you. The argument for the combination is here in this corner. As you can see, when you add lenalidomide to daratumumab in this preclinical model, things get very exciting. I'll show you the clinical data that Ruben also touched on to support that. Similarly for bortezomib, and look what happens when you put all three together. And RVD DARA is now being started prospectively by my colleague, Dr. Peter Voorhees, as part of the Griffin study, which incorporates transplant. And I encourage you uh, in, the, in the community who are uh, uh, practitioners who can refer patients to appropriate centers uh, to participate in that study. I think, for example, Ola Griffin is opening at Memorial, correct, I believe. And uh, Ruben, I think, for the same also at, at Cornell. And so an extraordinary study, hopefully, going forward. The data you've already heard, so I won't dwell on it because it's just remarkable for DARA plus IMID, DARA plus bortezomib. This is Antonio's work, one prior line of therapy. This is in relapse disease, so it's going to go on fire when we go into the newly diagnosed setting. And then this is really my concluding slide. When we think about myeloma in the future, my argument would be that we must combine strategies. This is truly not a zero-sum game, and we need all the tools in the toolbox uh, to do the job. The good news is there are a bundle of tools with us already and lots more to come. I particularly want to bring your attention to the uh, uh, bo boxes on the right here, which I think bode very well for the future. And on that note, just to acknowledge that this has not happened in a vacuum, been a remarkable partnership uh, involving our pharma partners, academia, our regulators, and most importantly, our patients and the various advocate groups, including MMRF and IMF and others involved. And with that, I'll just say thank you.